Today, we will talk to Sri Rajat Mitra, a renowned psychologist who has worked extensively on victims of genocide. He has authored a number of books on genocide, clash of civilization, and gender justice. He was the recipient of United Nations Public Service Award for Gender Justice in 2011. We are delighted to have him here with us. Rajita, thank, thank you for you. being with us today. We are eager to hear about your work and your thoughts on genocide victims of India, especially Bengali Hindus, and why it is the time for us to break the silence on Bengali Hindu genocide. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, it is uh, an honor to be on this uh, platform and talk about something that uh, I am uh, working on very closely uh, right now. Uh, after uh, studying about Kashmiri uh, genocide, I am now focusing upon Hindu genocide and the current book uh, which I am uh, writing, it is uh, based upon the trauma of the Bengalis and what uh, people in the state of Bengal went through for the last uh, 200 uh, years and how it uh, you know can be termed as uh, a genocide terming something as a genocide can be quite challenging because you know no other definition in recent times probably has been as controversial and as political i would say uh, as the term genocide because uh, the people who have committed the genocide they want to hide this term and uh, bengali genocide is something that involves some of the world's most powerful some of the world's most uh, uh, some of the world's biggest authorities so uh, they have uh, created uh, you know through a series of measures uh, calculated murders which have resulted in uh, millions of people dying over a long period of time so that counts uh, in my opinion and uh, as we will soon see in others opinion too very soon as a genocide now uh, if we see uh, i mean uh, genocide it is uh, there are three genocides which are recognized uh, right now uh, officially one is the armenian genocide the jewish genocide and the last is sometimes you know, between either the Rwandan genocide or uh, the Cambodian, uh, you know, genocide, right? But there have been many genocides uh, in the world apart from that. Uh, a genocide, as we know, the uh, mass killing of people of one race, uh, you know, by another. And uh, the, you know, history of the world is filled with that. So if we see the last century, it is very often called the century of uh, you know genocide and uh, if we you know see that uh, the genocide which have been brought forward are sometimes the tip of the iceberg and the majority of killings that have taken place have uh, you know you know under the surface which are not talked about not shared with not uh, you know dealt with so the genocides in India are of that nature. Now, why is it that it does not uh, come forward? I mean, you know, uh, that's often a question asked of me that uh, historically uh, we have suffered uh, far more than the Native uh, Americans who were slaughtered down the centuries. If we see, we have uh, more people dying of famine than uh, say you know the people who died in Stalin's Gulag, right? So why is it that those mass murders or issues have uh, you know I mean not got the attention of the world? So I mean these are some of the issues that we will uh, you know discuss today. That why the genocides in Indi in India, particularly the Bengali genocide, as we you know uh, I would like to call it has been hidden and has not been talked about uh, by uh, you know people there are uh, many reasons for that bengal as we know and punjab uh, both were uh, the areas which uh, were probably 
uh, opposing colonialism the most uh, at a certain point of time. No other area or no other group of people were opposing colonialism of the British or, or for that matter for any other uh, place systematically in a sustained way as uh, Bengal. And therefore, the full wrath of the British people, the colonialists, it uh, fell on Bengal and they wanted to exterminate uh, us in every possible way. Now, uh, extermination is just not, uh, you know, done by developing a concentration camp and killing and sending people to gas ovens. Extermination can also be done by uh, destroying the soul of the people, by robbing them of their language, closing their schools, uh, throwing the you know feelings inside them that they are inferior, uh, creating laws that are deeply humiliating, uh, or institutions that are deeply humiliating, saying that uh, you are lesser human beings. So if those things work, then you don't need to really kill people physically. And that is what uh, I would say the Bengal genocide particularly has been all about, that uh, in a systematic way, the spirit of the people, the, uh, the intellectual caliber of the people, the intellectual capital of the people uh, was systematically exterminated by the British over the last uh, two centuries. And this is what uh, I, uh, you know, uh, will be uh, talking about and, you know, sharing. Now, the British, uh, they were scared of the Bengalis. Like, you know, if you see the perpetrator and uh, the victim relationship in a genocide, often the perpetrators are deeply scared of the victims. Like, in a way, uh, the, the Nazis, they were scared of the Jews. I mean... It sounds ironical, but they felt that the Jews controlled the world. They dealt, uh, you know, if, if they are not uh, brought under control, uh, you know, they will take charge of their lives and they will get exterminated. It is important to know that uh, perpetrators always in a genocide think of themselves as victims. They feel that they are the victims, and so therefore they feel the moral righteousness the moral rightness to destroy uh, their victims using mass extermination methods. So that's why it's like, for example, when Churchill, he diverted the food and three million people died in Bengal. His, uh, his sense of victimization was, if I don't do it, we will die. And these people, they don't you know, deserve to live. So therefore, I'm perfectly justified in doing so. So there is a reverse victimization that runs deep in people who commit genocide. And that is what we see that uh, it was uh, done. Uh, you know, whether, I mean, the la I mean, whether it was in the 1971 war where the uh, Pakistan army committed, uh, you know, mass uh, killing uh, on the Bengalis, or whether it was the partition of Bengal, or whether it was the famine, all these systematic attempts at extermination has uh, revealed a deep scare of the Bengali by the people who try to control them and dominate them. Bengalis have been intellectuals. Bengalis have been people who have shown great resilience. And they were the ones who rose maximum against uh, the British, for example, in the freedom movement. So it won't be an exaggeration to say that they were able to create a deep fear within the British and the British re retaliated by trying to exterminate uh, Bengalis, us as a, a race. Okay. So this fear of Bengalis has remained. I mean, it was the British, earlier it was the Mughals, then it was, uh, you know, the Pakistan uh, who felt that, you know, this country, uh, this part, would overtake us, so we better exterminate them. So this desire to exterminate Bengalis is not something which is new. And uh, under it has only taken different shapes and forms, whether a famine, whether it is mass killing through an army, whether it is dividing the country, uh, whether it is uh, you know destroying their institutions and making them feel, all of which are essential part of a genocide. A genocide is not just killing. 
a genocide is also destroying the people. For example, not very many people know, perhaps, that the Nazis, they tried to destroy the Jews by first destroying their libraries, their books, because they knew that the soul of uh, the Jewish community lies in their library. For example, there's a story about uh, you know, Vilna, which was a Polish uh, city where the Nazis they systematically found all the Jewish books, took away the main ones and destroyed the rest. They did not, as uh, the person in charge of it said, I don't want even a single book of Jews to remain by which uh, the even if one single Jew is left, he should be able to recreate uh, his uh, civilization once again. So Bengalis also face that. The British destroyed our books, our schools, our intellectual cap you know, capital, our ability to imagine us as free human beings. Uh, they did that uh, you know, by dividing the country. They did that by destroying the schools, the institutions, seeing to it that we only read you know, a select material. So all this have been systematic attempts at exterminating uh, the Bengalis. Now, the Bengalis have uh, unfortunately not spoken about it. And as a psychologist, when I ask people so the I noticed two kinds of responses. One is that uh, it is the past. Why bring it up? You know, what good it is going to serve? Let us, uh, you know, move forward. The, uh, the second is that if, uh, you know, we go into that, are we not going to provoke uh, many more people uh, and, you know, once again, bring on another genocide uh, or another destruction? So as a result, uh, our society, the Bengali society, does live under a mass fear that it can erupt again. And we do not uh, you know, want it. I mean, it won't be an exaggeration to say that there is often a deep sense of uh, fear that uh, one may notice at a mass, at a collective level, in Bengali you know, people. Right? So Bengalis have tried to rise in different ways. Uh, you know, against oppression, against uh, what they see as injustice. And each time the response that has been forced upon them has been far higher than uh, what the initial response which started. I mean, if you take Naxal Bari movement, the response by the government was so traumatic that it reminded uh, many Bengalis uh, of uh, the trauma that their earlier generations had gone. And uh, they said, OK, no, I don't think that we want this again in our lives, right? So there is this uh, deep sense of passivity that reigns uh, amongst our people. And uh, I would imagine that uh, probably by the next generation, this uh, feeling that we carry inside ourselves of fear would, uh, would come up, and it would erupt itself, and we would start examining looking at uh, the series uh, of uh, mass murders and exterminations uh, at different periods of history that we have gone through. I uh, would say somewhere around the next 10 to 20 years that I see it coming in our society, uh, in Bengali society, because like all of the societies where the you know ideas of what happened to our ancestors, it starts rising at a certain stage uh, when a certain fault line happens, appears in society, this one would also uh, happen uh, perhaps in the next 10 to 20 years. That is my guess. So that uh, with that uh, short uh, talk, I would like to stop here and uh, would uh, you know uh, request that if there are questions and answers, that you know we can take this topic forward. Uh, thank you, Rajada. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, yes, we, we do have um, a few questions. Uh, now, the first question that I have is um, on transgenerational trauma. trauma. Um, yes, you, you have um, talked extensively on it in your past lectures and blogs. So my question is, what is transgenerational trauma and how does it affect the victims of genocide? Okay. Uh, uh, 
Uh, yes, I have. I'm working on transgenerational trauma, and this is uh, one of the, uh, you know, my favorite topics. Uh, now, transgenerational trauma is uh, something in which we, you know, when we know that uh, first we we have to understand trauma. A uh, trauma is an overwhelming event, which uh, you know very often uh, makes people silent. As the saying goes, that the language of trauma is silence. So uh, the generation that faces the trauma, the overwhelming event, uh, has to think of survival. So, for example, the generation that faced uh, the division of Bengal had to go silent, uh, you know, in order to survive, right? Because it was too big, too overwhelming, and event. So. Trauma is not something that you know we can describe eloquently, like we can describe other things. So, if you notice uh, that uh, you know there is not much uh, literature or poems about the division of Bengal, it is there, but in terms of the degree of the event or the magnitude of the event, it is almost uh, you know negligible about uh, you know the the event per se. The same, for example, you know, we see a parallel between, say, you know, uh, say Germany and, uh, you know, Germans don't talk about Second World War. The Jews, uh, they did not talk about the Second World War for a long time. Germans did not talk about it, uh, you know, for a very long time because, it, I mean, they have to emerge uh, out of that, that the survivor mindset that you know drives them that tells them hey be silent uh, in order to protect yourself so uh, bengalis have also you know done the same thing like for example when i you know talk to many uh, talk to many bengali intellectuals and i ask them that we have gone through so much trauma but i don't see that reflected in the writing of our work you know it is uh, sometimes good imaginative writing but focusing upon trauma, upon oppression, upon the colonialist violence, I don't see that kind of literature or poetry, you know, uh, you know, emerging. I mean, there may be rebellious poetry like Kaji, Nojrul Islam's, or you know, Tagore's, but you know, they err on the side of caution to not address it directly. And I think that they reflected the general ethos of the age where it was uh, you know, considered safe enough not to talk about it. So what happens is that the trauma remains silent, but it gets passed on to the next generation. And it happens in two ways. I mean, there is something called epigenetic transmission and also through silence. So for example, the topics that we don't talk about in our family, we know what topics they are. You know, every family knows that, okay, this is something that we don't talk about. And if you ask uh, many Bengali families, uh, you know, they talk about, okay, we lost so-and-so in Nakshalbari. We lost so-and-so in this. And then if the, top, if the topic goes on further, then the topic, uh, you know, goes on to the freedom struggle, the famines, the division of Bengal. They are all chained together. You know, they are all kind of, uh, you know, joined together as if by a thread. And they have not faced closure. They continue alive in our minds. Uh, that is what is transgenerational trauma is. The series of trauma, uh, the series of overwhelming events that the society has faced get bound together with each other and remains like a silent complex within our psyche, which, you know, within our hearts. We don't speak about it. We stay silent about it. We know what it is. It is something that uh, you know is the unspeakable, and it continues for three, four, five generations till one day. You know, when the survivorhood is uh, gone, then the generations start talking about it. Like if you see the Armenian genocide, it took the Armenian mass killing took place in 1917. 1 1.7 million people you know, officially died as a result of that. The people who raised it were in the, uh, you know, were in the, uh, in the 1990s and the, you know, 2000, that is the stage when the whole thing started coming up, the stories, what they had hidden for that long, because 
an overwhelming event or trauma, it cannot be also hidden forever. It is there within us. It is just waiting for the right time to come up. So that is the our Bengali trauma too. It is, uh, you know, we have gone through series of uh, overwhelming events that has affected us as a community, scaring us, making us think of survival. And when the survival feeling, you know, goes down and reaches a certain threshold, we will start talking about it. So that is transgenerational trauma, uh, as uh, I would like to share. That's uh, wonderfully explained. Um, now, you said that um, the transgenerational trauma, it stays for uh, three, four or five generations before the next generation start talking about it. So with each passing generation, does the effect of this trauma go up or does it go down or does it stay the same? Uh, it does not go up or down. It uh, remains as what we say as traumatic memory. You know, uh, like, you know, we have normal memory. Normal memory reduces, you know, it is like over a period of time. I mean, something that you did say five years ago, uh, it slowly starts uh, dimming, you know, it dims and, you know, slowly becomes less intense. You don't remember it with that much passion. Uh, the memory becomes, uh, you know, a little weak as uh, age goes by. But with traumatic memory, nothing of that sort happens. Traumatic memory remains as intense, as powerful as when it happened. So, for example, a traumatic event that has happened with me, say, 10 years ago, after 10 years, I will recall it with as much intensity and uh, passion and vividness as it happened. It does not change. So uh, brain studies have also shown that traumatic, you know, traumatic memory remains encapsulated in our head and does not undergo a change. It remains uh, by and large the same, right? Now, what happens with uh, traumatic memory, like for example, studies with children who went through, say, a trauma at an early age, it shows that when they grow up, they may not remember what exactly happened, but there are certain symptoms, certain signs uh, by which they recall that something terrible took place uh, very early in the what you, you know what we call in the preverbal stage. So trauma does not leave us. Trauma kind of gets encapsulated within us, within our system, and stays. It neither goes up or neither goes down. <clears throat> The only way for trauma to, uh, you know, let go of it is when we create uh, healing groups, healing ceremonies, healing talks in which people come forward and in a ritualized, well-defined, therapeutic way, share what uh, happened uh, or what they recall or the story of uh, their trauma. For example, I, uh, you know, uh, one example of trauma that I uh, see from recent times in India is about uh, the Ram Janmabhumi. Now, the uh, people see Ram Janmabhumi as a religious issue. As a psychologist, I see it as an unresolved trauma that remain. I mean, it, it's a perfect example of transgenerational trauma. The temple was destroyed. The trauma remained. So after it would resurface every time and then, and after five years, uh, 500 years, it kind of emerged in full intensity for people to go ahead and destroy the mosque over there. So it's the same like what happened, you know, when Native Americans protested against the Dakota pipeline, they went and protested, they heralded that place, they surrounded that place, right? So the memory of transgenerational trauma is collective in nature. It exists within groups of people as a single thing that they all went through collectively. So Bengalis, uh, we Bengalis also have that sense of transgenerational trauma where a collective sense of deep hurt and loss and pain that we went through repeatedly over at periods of time in history remains. And it remains uh, uh, and it is waiting for, uh, I would say, uh, appropriate time for it to come up. 
So if we start expressing that through groups, through rituals, and through creating awareness, that is the safest way for that trauma to come up without causing any violence or any untoward, uh, you know, incident in the present. Right. So we do have a lot to be hopeful for. Um, hopefully our next generation or maybe this generation will rise and uh, start talking sure. about it. Exactly. But you also said that the language of trauma is silence and silence yes. always encourages the aggressors and it, it, it uh, completely crushes the spirit of the victims. So is it possible to make the victims aware of this trauma? Like Bengali Hindus, sure. they are not aware that they have any such trauma. They, they take it as an event of the past and uh, they feel uh, that they are living in the present and all they have to do is live their life and they don't have to worry about the history or um, their grandparents' history or what they have gone through. So is it possible to make the victims aware of this trauma? Very much. I think victims do become aware of their trauma. Like, if, for example, you see in uh, Africa, in, uh, there is this place called Point of No Return. You know, uh, millions of Black Americans right now routinely visit that place. Uh, they, you know, if you see their reactions over there, many of them, in fact, I would say most of them become deeply emotional, perturbed. They raise their hands in protest. Now, these are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, these are not vagabonds or lower class, lower socioeconomic group people who are going there. They are well settled in life. They are doing well. Everything is going fine for them. So why are all these people in thousands and hundreds of thousands going over there from where their ancestors were brought back. I mean, there are so many better places in the world if one can, you know, say they can go to, but they choose to go to that place, right? So what is it? What is the appeal of that uh, place for all these people? And why do knowing that they would get disturbed, they would get upset, they go over there? Because the memory of that remains. You know, when Michelle Obama talked about that, uh, you know, she writes it in her memoir that when she was uh, sitting at her window and she saw her daughters playing in the front yard and uh, she could not stop crying, you know, the, uh, the feeling of sadness and tears, uh, you know, came up in an overwhelming way because she thought uh, that, you know, five generations ago, uh, you know, her uh, family, they were slaves. And, uh, you know, now she's sitting in the White House and uh, she could not understand where this, you know, overwhelming sense of sadness, uh, you know, that came from, from watching her two daughters, right? So the sadness or the trauma or uh, the, uh, you know, feeling, uh, it remains. It only, you know, it is suppressed. We suppress that. And as you said, a lot of Bengalis are suppressing it right now. They say, ki, ki hobe kore, kano korbo, you know, uh, let past and bygone be bygones. But that is something talked by victims everywhere. You know, it is not something just us. And uh, it just waits for the perception of the environment around me as safe, as changed for it to emerge. So that will happen with us too very soon. There are no techniques or methods as such. It is that there are certain false lines, there are certain changes, structural changes that a society undergoes as a result of which it's fault lines, it is, you know, it's the, the deeper feelings held by people for generation just bursts, uh, you know, out. So we have to just wait for that. Right. And now I wanted to talk about um, Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah. Um, as, as you know now that um, it's not just in India, but in world over, we have a lot of conflicts going on between Hindus and other communities. Like recently, uh, we've had, uh, I think uh, we were right in the middle of an intense conflict in, in Leicestershire and in, in UK. Yeah. And um, there was one in Canada recently. Yeah. And uh, in the US as well, I see that um, Hindus have been receiving flag from the left-wingers and the right-wingers. So we have no friends anywhere. Now that 
that is um, that is one thing to think about. Another thing is, among the left wingers and the right wingers who are attacking us in US, many of them are Indians themselves. So yeah. this this particular scenario, this this Stockholm syndrome of uh, trying to eat your own and and trying to completely disassociate yourself from what your community is going through and trying to aid the other side is this also one of the symptoms of, of transgenerational trauma or or is it a completely different set of feeling uh i would not say that it is completely different but uh what i would like to say is that uh, you know what we see happening in england and leicester and uh, in um, in canada uh what hindus are doing over there is something that they have done for centuries they have tried to appease the perpetrator uh, identify with them support them with the belief that somewhere the perpetrator or others uh, you know will let them go so whether you take the theory of you know ganga jamna tahzeeb uh, in uh, you know over here uh, or uh, numerous ways in which uh, the hindus are always making concessions uh, for actually ethnic groups or you, know, you have uh, muslims or uh, christians for whom they are you know, doing so they are doing the same thing historically again and again it's that since both of them have ruled over them so by adapt, uh, you know by adapting to them by appeasing them somehow the problem will get solved what i think in the present uh, generation and in the probably the coming generation we are going to discover is that the problem is not going to solved any more by appeasing adapting to other people but carving out your own identity you know separating yourself from uh, that uh, notion from that identity where you would adapt and appease to others that is not going to work and i think that many hindus are already you know discovering that there is a mass movement uh, which you know talks about for example jago hindu jago so there are a lot of uh, you know there is a lot of awareness that is happening right now in terms of uh, creating one's own identity right so uh, your question that whether stockholm sort of from generational trauma or not it is closely related but the two things are uh, you know uh, have their own independent meanings generational trauma is a generally is a trauma that goes on from generation to generation it gets passed on from generation to generation the uh, stockholm syndrome is adapting to the perpetrator you know identifying his or her goals as ours with and with the belief uh, that if we you know get close enough to them we won't hilaj do not know of creating their identity back which i am very glad to discovering right now and i think that it would go a long way in telling uh, as that in our friends you know to uh, on our own we have the strength to do that right um now let's talk about the other side of the spectrum the the victors of the genocide now you've worked with the islamists in thailand and uh, uh, convicted terrorists in indian prison so do you think the victors of the genocide do they go through any kind of remorse or guilt or uh, do they go through some sort of a uh, victors relief what about the next generation of these uh, victors of genocide do they go through any kind of remorse or guilt is it possible to uh, make them feel guilty for the action of uh, their own or their forefathers it's uh, it's very um, it's very difficult uh but not impossible like what the jews uh, you know did uh, when they tried uh, to tell the world of the you know the antisemite nature i mean it pervades everywhere they, they also found a lot of resistance people you know live in denial in such issues 
uh, but what they did was that they uh, you know tried to create through uh, museums through books through uh, literature uh, through talks through creating you know ritualized uh, you know memorials and you know events uh, and awareness and it is something which is an ongoing process it is not going to stop i mean they realize that they have to do it every day uh, day after day maybe for another century so it is something that we also have to do we have to be convinced of it ourselves what has happened to us the intellectuals uh, within our community have to come forward they have to speak about it they have to talk about it in order to go ahead like let me tell you this that i'm a professor uh, of uh, clinical psychology and i often talk about trauma in my lecture i mean trauma is one of the topics i talk about i have noticed that in my class when uh, you know there is a kashmiri muslim he immediately gets up and talks about the trauma that his community has gone through in kashmir but kashmiri hindus who have gone through far higher trauma there was one person he did not get up and speak so i called him aside later and i said that uh, why didn't you speak about it that you had to leave your home that you lost your family that it was burnt down you cannot go back right now over there how you were threatened how your neighbor celebrated why didn't you speak about all this so he was very quiet and said i'm sorry sir but my family has told me not to talk about this my family has said that why create more uh, you know enmity with kashmiri muslims maybe we can that way go back to our homeland one day but if we start talking about it and raising an issue they would never allow us to come back right so this kind of a fear that pervades our uh, you know community our children uh, is something very uh, you know worrisome and i would say that you know the intellectuals need to look at that because a few people raising it on say selective platforms will not make a change it will make a change when say every student every young person every man and woman you know begins to speak about it and makes an issue out of it that is when it will come out of the closet and if we have a culture of not speaking about it like this kashmiri hindu boy had uh, because his family had told him that that's the way we can go back he will never be able to they will never be able to go back with uh, this kind of an attitude so therefore we have to learn to be vocal to you know speak about it and only then uh, you know we need to see it as our right that uh, you know someone has taken it from us and we need to speak the truth so once when we start doing that then only that the world uh, will start believing that and the world will take us seriously not otherwise we cannot expect others to speak for us which we are doing right now we are going to different authorities we are going to different agencies and saying hey listen to our story speak for us no we have to speak for it ourselves like traumatized communities do or their spokespersons and every child in that community starts speaking about it that is when change starts coming about right now uh, yes of course we we should be speaking about it it's the victim communities who need to take ownership to talk about what they have gone through but in most places around the world there also seems to be a survivors guilt for the victims of genocide so the ones that got killed had been silenced forever but the survivors who were able to flee the genocide who were able to save their uh, children and themselves they always have to defend themselves as to why did they become victims why couldn't they be the victims i'll give you an example as is east bengali hindus have been criticized very harshly as to why they had to leave this bengal they they have been called um, cowards um they have been called um, land grabbers they've been called many other names which uh, yeah very slang right which which basically um, points out to the fact that uh, they had to leave either because they were not brave enough um that they were um, uh you know they, they were not strong enough 
or uh, they were not smart enough to understand the dangers and uh, fight back. So, and, and the funny thing is, the critics are also mostly from the Hindutva Brigade, the ones that we expect to be sympathetic to our, our cause. So why is there this culture of victim blaming among the victims themselves? Because the other Hindus are also a victim groups. So what, what causes people to assume that the victims of genocide must have done something to, 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 to deserve it? Uh, victim blaming is uh, quite universal. It is not limited to any particular geographic region. The Jews were blamed. Every, every group of victims has been blamed, uh, saying that if only you had not done this, then it would uh, you know, have been different. And uh, the the people who blame are also, you know, within the community and also outside the community. The reason for victim blaming often uh, lies in the fact that uh, if we don't blame the victim, what do we have to do? It will. Uh, we have to look at a mirror in our face and say that uh, okay, what could what I should have done differently. Right now, for example, let's take that uh, in '94, the uh, Jewish, uh, the Holocaust memorial was built. I have been there several times, but the, it was not easy to build the Holocaust memorial. '45 and '94, almost 50 years. Right? Why did America wait for 50 years to build a Holocaust memorial? The Jews they wanted land was not the problem exhibits were, were not the problem they had all that the issue was that america failed the jews they did not rescue the jews their president knew about what was happening if he had wanted he could have uh, you know gone ahead and made an issue out of it and you know done it he did nothing american establishment failed uh, and they don't want to acknowledge it in front of the world the leader of the you know free world same for the rest of the world europe everywhere else they did nothing for the jews so by blaming the jews they keep the issue away from themselves that yes we did not you know i mean you know we did not do anything so it's the same for us also you know in uh, the fact is that uh, uh, if you see the book, the blood telegram, America knew about the genocide of uh, Bengali Hindus in the 1971 war, right? The Jews, they decided to keep silent and do nothing. In fact, they went ahead and supported Pakistan. They, in fact, uh, you know, helped further in the genocide. Now, this is not a history that they want to be known, right? So uh, if you see others also, if you see Britain's colonial history, they don't want it to be known the degree of uh, mass murders they have committed in Kenya, in Africa, in India, and uh, in all of the places, right? So they want it to be hidden. So the opposite side of the coin of victim blaming is, uh, you know, taking ownership, taking accountability for those people who should have done something and who did nothing. So that's why uh, victim blaming is uh, used in order to shift responsibility, you know, from uh, you know oneself. Right? Nobody wants to face that. In fact, you know, as I said in the beginning of the talk, arriving at the definition of genocide was the most difficult. Every country of the Security Council, America, Russia, China, England, France, they uh, wanted to make it sure that. Uh, whatever is the definition, their country and what they have done to the rest of the world should not come within that purview, right? Russia did not want to say of the mass killings in their country. France did not, and Britain, they didn't want to talk about their colonialism and what happened. That should come under genocide. America did not want its history of Native Americans. So everybody wanted to avoid that. So its definition is so contentious and uh, that's simply because the focus turns away to responsive, you know, to the responsibility that you never took. Right. Now, uh, Hindus across all ethnicities have gone through some attempts of genocide at some point. So we have, we do have a similar collective grief. 
But grief has never been able to unite us. But it has created a kind of culture of uh, uh, grief thumping where one community will try to put another down because they've had to deal with a little less grief than the other. And sometimes they will try to put another down for completely opposite reason that uh, they've had to deal with significantly more grief than the other. Is this a typical victim behavior that instead of uh, taking it out on the aggressors, we try to take it out on other victims? Uh, that's a very good question. And uh, I would like to say this, that, uh, you know, since I, uh, um, I specialize in grief work, I, grief is uh, my area of studies apart from transgenerational trauma. There are certain things about grief that we need to, uh, you know, per perhaps I, I can share it with the uh, listeners of uh, this. One is that grief is universal. You know, which uh, which simply means uh, that the nature of grief faced uh, by people across the world is, uh, you know, by and large the same. And uh, the thing is that when I understand that, hey, my grief is the same as yours, it binds me deeply with another person, right? There is no deeper, uh, you know, binding force than grief. That's what it's meant by grief is universal. Uh, we Hindus, we have not grieved over our past. We have not even started that process. Uh, we have not started that process right now. We are just on the tip of it. For example, as I said, that, uh, you know, the Ram Janmabhumi, the destruction of the Babri, uh, breaking down of that was a grief reaction, right? So Hindus have not started to grieve. We have not grieved over our past. We have not the denial has broken, which is, uh, you know, which has been there. But what comes after denial is protest and anger, which is uh, something that, uh, you know, is the second stage of grief. There are uh, several other stages of grief, like pining, fear, rationalization. And as a mature society, as a rule of law society, we need to understand the stages that we have to go through when we go through the grieving process. And I can tell you this, that whether it's a Bengali Hindu or whether it's a, uh, you know, Rajasthani or a Maharashtran Hindu, for many, uh, the grieving process will be the same and uh, it will bind us together. So grief uh, is, uh, you know, only when we don't grieve, when we hold it uh, back within us and not let it come out, then we are in a competitive mode or spirit. But when, but once we start expressing it, once we start doing it in a you know therapeutic, healing way, then it binds us. And I firmly believe that uh, it is the universal nature of grief amongst us Hindus that will bind us deeply in the coming years and raise us as a collective force to deal with our issues. Right. Now, um, on, on Bengali Hindu genocide, now we've been suffering since the longest. Uh, uh, you, yeah. you, you name it, um, and we have suffered at their hands. Um, we've had uh, to endure the, uh, the Portuguese hermits who came into our yeah. shores and uh, took our boys and young men and women as prisoners and sold them as slaves elsewhere. Then we've had the Turkish, the Mughal invaders come in and created their um, history of invasion there with us. Then we've had the British, then we've had the recent most, the, the Pakistani regime. Um, now, with so much of history of pain, we have we seem to have the most underreported genocide in India and then probably around the world. So. Yeah. What is it that stops us from talking genocide? I mean, even if we, um, even if I, let's say, discount the genocide at the hands of the Pakistanis and the Mughals for, um, you know, keeping in view the secularism that we have prevailing in our society, what stops us from documenting the other types of genocide that we've gone through, like at the hands of the Portuguese or at the hands of the British? Uh, yeah, see, one thing which we need to see is that 
all all these events they are really not separate they are bound together by a thread so whether it's the portuguese or the english or the mogul or the pakistani we start talking about one all others are connected uh, you know to that right for example this is what the jews discovered it for themselves when they started you know talking about the holocaust they realized that they were going back centuries you know their entire history which is interwined and uh, they also so wonder why was that society ready you know in order to absorb the shock of uh, what it has gone through it needs the healing space it needs its intellectuals to come forward and create that healing space in which people can express their pain so if tomorrow we start talking about the genocide done by the pakistani soldiers along with that you know tied by the same thread we would talk about uh, other uh, mass violence mass killings that have taken place upon us and it will all go back it is all tied together it is not a, it is first of all not separate let's you know, put it like that. We have not faced. I mean, see, in early literature, in and Naxalari, no. Talk about uh, seventy-one. No. Do we talk about partition? Do we talk about freedom struggle? What we went through, the betrayal of uh, the Bengali revolutionaries uh, by others. You know. Bengal contributed so much uh, for the Indian freedom struggle in fact it India would not have become free without Subhash Chandra Bose and uh, you know they were they caused the English to run away but uh, the thing is that we have not come forward and uh, you know spoken about it asserted ourselves uh, that what really happened i mean uh, as i'm writing my current book uh, right now it's almost in the finishing stage it is a, it's called the island without a shore it is about what bengali revolutionaries went through and how they created fear what i discovered in uh, talking uh, and uh, in through archival material is that the bengalis created so much fear in the british the british were scared of us you know and they tried to do everything to suppress us but do we talk about the fear that we created in the brain anyone i have not found it anywhere i have found it in writings i have not found the intellectuals society speaking about it as to how we made the british run away when we start talking about that the you know that will be the next stage when uh, <laughs> uh we will be taken seriously that is my firm belief right no, I also want to raise this issue here. Um, when we when we talk about Bengali Hindu genocide, I, I would like to point out that there was a time when Bengali itself, the word itself, meant Bengali Hindu. Now today, um, because yeah. of our shrinking population, the word Bengali has been completely <coughs> hijacked from us. And today, Bengali means. Um, mostly to, to the global audience, Bengali means a Bengali speaking Muslim. So right. on, on this stage, the, the identity, the theft of our identity, how do we recover that? Because I believe that that is also a part of genocide. It's not just killing people, sure. but taking away the, our, their them. identity. The, yes, robbing <coughs> them of their very identity. Yeah. How do we recover that? Because this is um this has created a sense of confusion for us because when we talk about let's say like yeah. durga puja is very very close by we are like a, a week away from it today being mahalaya so when we say that durga puja is the biggest celebration of bengalis we have lots of bengali speaking muslims coming up and saying that no it is not it's, it's eid because um, there are more bengali speaking muslims than bengali speaking Hindus. And the fact that Bengali identity itself has been hijacked from us. So specifically now, Durga Puja is no longer a Bengali celebration. It's more like a Bengali the Hindu Bengal. celebration. Mm. 
Yeah. Right. So, so uh, as you see, the theft of this identity has created um, an unimaginable kind of crisis for us. <coughs> So how do we recover from that? Because genocide is such a, um, you know, it, it's such a, a broad issue. It has cultural, religious, political, all kinds of aspects. So is it possible for us to um, recover our identity and our, and our culture and not just um, recover from the trauma of death and loss or pain? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very important question you raised. The thing is that, yes, uh, the average uh, Bengali is still not aware that his identity is under threat. This happens when there is a clash, like, for example, last year, uh, you know, when there was a problem regarding the timings uh, of the immersion, uh, it, many people became aware of the fact that, hey, our identity is really right now under threat. So uh, we have to feel collectively as a society that our identity is a threat. And that will come up more and more as these crises come up. And we start realizing that, uh, you know, there are other groups which are trying to push us, us uh, edge us uh, up. And uh, I think that will, uh, you know, when we are pushed around, Probably that is the time when you know, we will head and spawn back and is our identity. I'd also like to talk about the, the partition of... ...things uh... going okay. But yes, then the issue of your... Hello. Uh, yes, I, I can hear you now. Yeah. So, yeah, I I missed the last part of what you said. Uh, no, I, I was saying that I, I also wanted to add to it that we also have uh, gone through not just a hijacking of the Bengali identity, but we have also gone through the partition of Bengali Hindu identity itself. Um, the, the Indian Bengalis, a certain section of Indian Bengalis, are now calling themselves Bengali Hindus. However, the Bengali Hindus from Bangladesh are calling themselves Bangladeshi Hindus. So even the Bengali Hindu identity itself has been partitioned. So I feel like as a global, I mean, in, in um, Europe or US, where we could have collectively fought and created diaspora, and uh, talked about our genocide in, in India as well as in uh, Bangladesh. Um, now we have two separate identities. Um, I, I have seen that in Europe and US, yeah. there are separate Bengali Hindu associations and separate Bangladeshi Hindu associations. Whereas we could have come together and created those associations um, um, together and uh, uh, brought up our issues uh, in yeah. the yeah uh, that's a very uh, that's a very important question i think uh, the bengali um, the bengali hindus the uh, and the bangladeshi hindus they uh, want both of them that some part of their roots remain intact so they may have different associations but i feel that it is possible very much to come uh, together on certain issues, okay? Uh, and uh, I would say that, you know, merging of the association will not lead to merging of uh, the two identities. But our identity has certain universals and grief is one of them. So if we have uh, a talk about, say, grief, if we have a talk about what binds us together, so that is something that can be overpowering in terms of joining the two people and identities together. So uh, that's what I feel is something which is currently, you know, uh, I won't say lacking, but it. I would say that it is very much on its way. There is uh, a slowly, you know, a sense growing towards the commonality, the universal, the universality between us. And the more we focus about it, the more this threat about Bengali Hindu identity, you know, vanishing, perhaps will go away. That is my strong belief. Right. And this is my last uh, question on this topic. 
and the last question for today is that in in Bangladesh as well as in Kashmir we have seen one of the greatest similarities from the aggressors um, yeah. in in Kashmir also the Kashmiri pundits were denied the identity of Kashmiri in totality yeah. they were called pundits not yeah. Kashmiri pundits not Kashmiri Hindus but just pundits whereas the Kashmiri Muslims were known as Kashmiris yeah. and similarly we see that in Bangladesh itself the the, the Muslims, the Bengali-speaking Muslims, call themselves Bengalis, but refer to the Bengali-speaking Hindus, who are the original Bengalis, as simply Hindus, as if they have yeah. no connection to the soil. The Bengali. Yeah. So, so this disassociation to the soil, which creates, or which which adds to another level of problem for us, because. When we go to the global diaspora, when we go to the United Nations to claim the, the, the torture that we are facing, we are not able to establish that we are the original sons of the soil. Because, you see, the identity itself, we are Hindus, only Hindus, whereas the, Beng the Bengali-speaking Muslims are Bengalis from Bangladesh. So to a third person, let's say to a Chinese or to an American, they can see the association between the two words, Bangladesh and Bengali. So to them, it would naturally seem that Bengalis or Bengali-speaking Muslims are sons of the soil of Bangladesh. Whereas Hindus, it has no similarity with the word Bangladesh. So therefore, there must be some form of outsiders. So it, it denies us the sympathy that we could have gotten from the global audience. So even if we bring up our genocide, the hijacking of our identity or or our complete lack of awareness towards it is creating a very difficult situation for us. What, what are your thoughts on that? Since you are um, living in the U.S., what uh, what do you feel? Does that... Uh, mm -hmm. okay. I'm not living in the U.S. Happen? I'm living in India right now. I so, see. Okay. Yeah, I'm living in India at the moment, but I've been, uh, been to U.S. many times and, uh, you know, been there. Uh, the first is that, as I said, it's the... It's a pro it's a multi-dimensional process, you know. One has to do it through uh, not only at the United Nations level, but also at uh, the level of uh, films, literature, many other ways, you know, in which you capture the intellectual space across uh, the universities. What we do is that, you know, we if we try to limit ourselves only to certain forums or one or two forums, then we are not going to succeed uh, very well. So we need to, you know, do it at multiple levels. Uh, and I say intellectual levels where we, you know, for example, uh, talk in universities, we talk through literature, we, we talk through poems, we talk through multiple sources of expression. Like, for example, if you see the recent movie Kashmir Files, why was it so disturbing? You know, I mean, it was only a film after all, because it uh, broke a certain tradition that you do not uh, talk about the trauma of uh, Kashmiri Pandits. It was probably the first film which talked about it raw, brutally as it was. But we need uh, many more films, many more books, many more forums like that. So once that happens at a global level, you know, and uh, with an awareness, I mean, it, you know, it has to happen at micro, national, uh, transnational level for us you know, for the world uh, to take note. I mean, once I went to a temple in USA and, uh, you know, the there were a couple of Indian Americans uh, who had brought their children for a religious, you know, class. So I saw the children, they were absolutely bored. They wanted to get away and the teacher was getting angry. So I went over to them and I started talking of the struggle of Hinduism what Hinduism has meant, how it has been, and they listened to it with rapt attention. Afterwards, they asked me that, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, what was it? I said, you were talking about abstract philosophy of the Gitas and Vedas uh, to them. These children are not interested. You have to talk to them in their language. 
in the schools they go to, what is the kind of a language they hear, what is the kind of a thing that will make them defend uh, their faith. And I just use that pedagogic, uh, you know, lessons that I've learned about dealing with children. So what I think came about was that the Indian priests, the Indian um, managers of temples, they need to have lessons in pedagogy in order to, you know, teach children to reach out to people, to capture the space. Once you do that at multiple levels, it's perhaps then that our fight to gain that space in United Nations will become a little easier. So without, uh, you know, gaining the intellectual space, without getting in the different industries like entertainment and people's imagination, it may be a little hard task to do. Right. Um, it was a wonderful discussion. Thank you for the word of hope, Rajuta. May our future be brighter than our present. Thank you. Thank you and good night.